So next, in trying to find what we should replace the ordinary notion of language with, Chomsky considers these two different conceptions, one he calls of e-language and one he calls i-language. And roughly speaking, e-language is very like the concept of language that Lewis used in the paper Languages and Language that we read last week. So if we're thinking of a language as an e-language, then we're really just thinking of it as a list of all the grammatical sentences in the language, plus the meanings of those sentences in the language. So for example, if we were to think about English as an e-language, The things that might be on the list might be things like the cat is on the mat, that sentence paired with its meaning, however we want to represent that. We might have the sentence it's raining, and whatever its meaning is, and so on. So we can just think of a language as a long list of all the sentences in the language plus what those sentences mean in the language. Now that be kind of, might seem kind of strange thinking about a language as a list of sentences plus their meanings. And what, Because one reaction you might have is, of, well of course you could never write down that list. And that's completely right. The list of sentences in English is probably infinite. So the way we would understand an e-language would not be by just trying to write down the contents of the list. We would never just try to write down the list of grammatical sentences plus their meanings. Rather, what we would try to do is we would try to figure out some rules which determine what gets to be on the list or not. So what people do in syntax is that they figure out the rules for what makes sentences grammatical or not. And if we're thinking about language as an e-language, then how we would describe what they're doing is, well, they're trying to figure out some rules which tell us whether a sentence, a particular sentence, is ever going to figure somewhere on the list. Now, we haven't been doing syntax. We haven't been thinking about grammar in this class. We've been mostly thinking about meaning. We spent a long time thinking about the meanings of names. And the question we've been asking as well has been, could, could be put in terms of e-language. So, we saw that some theories of names, they're really descriptions. Other theories of names, names refer directly that will make a difference to what, as we saw, to what the sentences containing names overall mean. So put it in terms of e-language is the way that, the way to think about what we've been doing is, well, what is the meaning that gets paired with various sentences on the list? If we have a sentence like, Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great, what kind of thing is the meaning that gets paired with that on the list? And again, we're not trying to write down all the list of sentences and write down the list of their meanings, but rather we're trying to come up with some general principles which tell us, well, what are the kinds of things that would be on the list? So if we're thinking about language as an e-language, a language really is just a long list of grammatical sentences together with their meanings. And the study of language is basically just trying to figure out the rules that determine what goes on the list. Syntax is figuring out the rules that determine whether a sentence is grammatical or not, semantics, which is the kind of thing we've been doing, is trying to figure out well, what kinds of things are the meanings that get associated with sentences? What kinds of meanings appear in the list? And again, neither requires that you actually sit down and like write out a list of everything in the language, because of course that would be absurd and impossible. So while philosophers have tended to think about languages in this way, Chomsky thinks that trying to study this concept of language, or trying to understand what's going on with this concept of language, is just completely misguided. Why is that? Well, he has two objections to focusing on e-languages. One comes, comes from what he calls semi-grammatical sentences. So he observes that there are some sentences of English where it seems clear that they're not fully grammatical, and yet there's no real difficulty in figuring out what they're supposed to mean. So he gives the example of, the child seems sleeping. If somebody were to say that, well, you would recognize that it's not fully a grammatical sentence of English, but you would immediately grasp what they were trying to tell you. You would infer that they're trying to tell you that this, the child seems to be sleeping. And the important thing as well is that that is kind of always the way that you interpret it. You would never interpret them as saying that the child is sleepy or something like that. You would always interpret it as seem, you would always interpret seems sleeping as seems to be sleeping rather than something else. So Chomsky wants to say with sentences like these, they actually don't really neatly fall into the category of grammatical or ungrammatical. Now they're clearly not fully grammatical because no, no fully competent English speaker would say them. But they're not really ungrammatical either because 
there seem there does seem to be a right way to understand what that sentence is saying. But this idea of a semi-grammatical sentence doesn't really fit in to this way of thinking about the e-language. Because remember, in e-language, it's a, less, a list of grammatical sentences, among other things, and then we pair those with their meanings. How would we sort of fit in to that, Chomsky seems to be thinking, where, where do the semi-grammatical sentences fit into that? Something else worth saying about this as well is that Chomsky's idea is not, is not that it's sort of vague whether this is grammatical. So sometimes we talk about things being vague. For instance, think about the concept of being bald. There are some people who are bald, there are some people who are not bald, and there are people in between where it's kind of hard to say whether, whether or not they're bald. Th those are cases of, of vagueness, cases where it's borderline whether somebody is bald or not. But Chomsky thinks that the idea of being something being vague or something being borderline is very different from this idea of being semi-grammatical. It's not vague whether the sentence the child seems sleeping is part of English or not. It's perfectly determinate that it's not uh, a fully grammatical sentence of English. It's just it has this other status that is different from ungrammatical. And he thinks that the e-language way of thinking about it just can't explain what this other status of semi-grammaticality is. The second kind of objection he gives relates to the thing we were talking about last time, last week, particularly when we talked about the case of Irish and Smirish. So we said, so one thing we saw is that pinning down the meanings of sentences does not necessarily pin down all the meanings of the words in the sentences. So for instance, on this way of thinking about an e-language, it's a long list of sentences paired with their meanings. But suppose the sentence S, suppose the sentence is, the example we had last time, David Boylan is Irish. So we'll imagine that's the sentence S1. The fact that we know that the sentence S1 is supposed to be an M, whatever M is, doesn't tell us what the individual words in it mean. Because as we saw last week, even if we know what a sentence means overall, there's always going to be loads of different ways of assigning meanings to the words that make it come out having the same meaning. So one thing that seems to be missing from the idea of an e-language is any concept of word meaning. But Chomsky thinks that this is a really big problem. So we saw last time that Lewis was a bit blasé about it. He said, well, it's just kind of tough. Maybe there's no fact of the matter what things words mean. But Chomsky wants to say, no, this is actually a huge problem for the notion of an e-language. Because it just is a fact of the matter whether, when English speakers use the word is Irish, whether in their brains they're associating is Irish with the property of being Irish, or with the property of being Smirish. There just is a fact of the matter about that. But since that fact isn't reflected in the notion of an e-language, saying, like, describing English as an e-language, that doesn't tell you what the meanings of the words are, for the reasons that we talked about last week. That seems to mean that just focusing on e-languages is going to leave out something really important about what's going on in the brains of English speakers or Japanese speakers or any language at all. So what is the alternative, you might ask? So we've said something about e-languages and we saw said that, well, Chomsky is pretty unhappy about thinking of language as, as an e-language. But what, would, what might be the alternative? And the alternative is this idea of what he calls an I language. And this is sort of cognitive in the way that we talked about before. So Chomsky says we can sort of thinking about, think about the process of acquiring a language like this. Our brains sort of start out in an initial state. He calls it something boring like S, S0. And when our brains are exposed to, to a language, so suppose you, know, you grow up in an English speaking community, you're exposed to English, your brain ends up in some sort of new state, state of maybe calling being being an English speaker. An I language is basically whatever state your brain is in once it's done learning a language. That is that is an I language. An, an I language is basically a certain kind of brain state. Now again, we mean brain state at a very high level talking about the kind of thing we're talking about when we're talking about a brain state, or this kind of brain state, is like talking about a kind of program run by a computer. But the idea is having an eye language, well that's just whatever your brain is like at a very high level whenever it's done learning language. 
And one way he puts it is that we kind of start out with what you might call a sort of language learning mechanism or language learning device. And it's a hypothesis in, lingui in, in it's a hypothesis in linguistics that there are just all sorts of constraints on the language learning device in your brain that tells you basically what language can or can't be like. So we talked about this a, a few weeks ago when we talked about the idea of certain things in language being innate. We said that, well, what we mean by saying certain things in language are innate is that you sort of come hardwired knowing that no, no spoken languages are going to have certain features. So you all, you've kind of ruled out potential languages from the get-go. And this idea of figuring out what, what sort of features are hardwired in or put it different, slightly differently, what features you already know to ignore, what hypotheses you know not to test. This is all kind of stuff that's hardwired into the language learning device you might think of as being in your brain when you, when you start off learning language. And the reason why the concept of an eye language is important, Chomsky thinks, is because, well, by studying particular eye languages, so when we study, when we do linguistics or we do semantics, we study particular human languages, we figure, we find out what those languages are like. But what we're really trying to do at the end of the day is say something about what the language learning device is. Because by studying all these various different languages, we get a sense of what the particular constraints are and what language could be like. Because all the kind of constraints on what kinds of languages we could end up speaking, so obviously there are lots of different languages, but linguists tend to think that they all, at some deep level, share some features. What features they share are supposed to be sort of, as Chomsky thinking about, hardwired into this language learning device or language learning state that people, that humans kind of come, come equipped with when they're born. So on that notion of, of language, it's, it is quite clear how it's supposed to be cognitive. Having an eye language, well, that's just for your brain to be in a particular kind of state, characterized at a very high level. And basically, by thinking about the eye, all the various eye languages that actually exist in the real world, all the different kinds of languages people speak, we learn more about what that initial state of the brain must be like. By, fi by figuring out what all languages have in common, we get, to, we get a better picture of what's hardwired into the brain from the get-go. Before we wrap up, I will say some quick things about the, the two objections Chomsky makes, because I do think there are some things that people who you know, defend the e-language approach that we've been basically working within, probably for the whole semester, uh, can say in response. So let's sort of go back to the e-language picture, where a language is really just a sort of list of sentences with their meanings. I think the e-language person might just say in response that, well, that was sort of an oversimplified way of thinking about language, but still that when we complicate it in the right way, it will still be sort of recognizably true to the original idea of an e-language. So let's take the first example of the semi-grammatical sentences. On this way of thinking about an e-language, the way we write down, the way we represent which sentences are grammatical and which sentences aren't is we just sort of, we write down a list of the sentences that are grammatical. But there's nothing really to stop us from saying that actually really there's two categories. So we write down the grammatical sentences and then once we're done with that, we sort of write down the semi-grammatical sentences. And then we also say, well, what sentences, what kind of meanings that they seem to have. I should say, when I say write down these things, I don't obviously mean literally write them down. And also, we would also the way we sort of write them down is we figure out the rules which tell us which sentences are, are grammatical or not. And likewise, we figure out the rules which tell us what things, words mean. But it still seems like, fun, you know, even if the way that we, even if we put the way we figure out what's on the list is by saying what the rules are. It does, I'm not totally sure why we couldn't just say, well, actually, when we're thinking about it in terms of lists, there's a list of the grammatical stuff, and there's also the list of the semi-grammatical stuff. So that's why I think that the defender of the e-language could say to Chomsky's first objection. To the second objection, that word meaning is not pinned down by sentence meaning, I mean, I, I, here I think we can just say something that Lewis said, 
which is that, well, again, maybe we should just think there's more going on in the list. So maybe in addition to thinking of a, of a language as a list of sentences and their meanings, we should also add to that a list of words and their meanings. And then we, we, oh, maybe you also have a list of rules about how we combine meanings of words to get sentence meanings. So again, just like in the other case, it seems like what the defender of the e-language approach should say is like, well, we just make whatever our list is, we just add more things to it. We make a more sophisticated list than this original for sort of crude one of just writing down sentences and their meanings. So Lewis didn't want to go this way. He wanted to say, well, all there really is a sentence meaning, word meaning, just sort of is, is sort of derivative and indeterminate because sentence meaning doesn't pin down word meaning. But it's not really obvious that we have to follow him on that. We could still fundamentally think of language as just a list of the way expressions are paired with meanings, and just say there's more on the list than sentences. That being said, it doesn't that doesn't necessarily, so saying that the concept of an E language has more going for it than Chomsky says does not that's not by itself to say that an I language is uninteresting either. The upshot maybe I'm suggesting is that I'm not really sure that Chomsky is right that we have to choose between these two things, that only one of them is interesting and that that, that I the interesting one is I language. Rather, I think there's space here to say, well, both of these are important concepts, and we should think about both of them when we do philosophy of language and linguistics.